Good to be here, to be the people of God, to gather, to hear the word, to pray together, to sing together, to worship God, to bring our hearts as one before the Lord. What a joy it is to be here. I'm Pastor Hans. Welcome to Martin Luther Lutheran Church. I'm glad you're here, tuned in, ready for worship. Let us turn our hearts now to God and worship as one in the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. All of your sins are forgiven by God Almighty, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. What's in Pastor's bag? Yeah, what's in Pastor's bag? What's in Pastor's bag? Yeah, what's in Pastor's bag? I don't know what's in there. What's in Pastor's bag? Hi, I'm Pastor Hans. I'm Professor Anya. And I'm Pastor Wes. Wes put something in here. I already heard what it was. I didn't see it. They said it was a hammer. Hammer! Hammer time! P.S. I made a bunch of donut jokes beforehand. Mmm, donuts. Donuts. You need So, this is a soft hammer. Ow! Ow! <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have done that. I don't want my kids hitting each other with a play hammer. Oh, wait, already. I. So, I'm not a judge? Order, order. Who said you're a judge? Is that why you got You won't be the judge? <laughs> are you, Kinda. Are you gonna send me to dad prison? I sentence you to go get milk for 15 13 years. minutes. Oh, 15 minutes. Of laying with Lego. That's a good punishment, Your Honor. I will gladly accept that punishment. <laughs> Does Ari get a punishment playing with Legos? Listen to me. <laughs> Anyways. Does she have to do chores? Is that her punishment? Her punishment is she has to go play with her Barbies. Yay! Anyways. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Who, who made you judge? Arya's gone. Arya took that ruling seriously. She's going to go play with Barbies now. I have to hammer. So judges, what do judges do? They go bang, bang. Order. All right. Order in what? Order in the food court. Food court. You're hilarious. Order in the court. So judges hear cases and they interpret law. Oh, wait, I thought they were... They apply the law and interpret the law. Oh, wait, I thought they were supposed to keep food fights from happening in food court. Wah, wah, wah. Congratulations, Wes. You're well on your way to dad joke starting with this. Not the food court, mister. My kid. I love it. So, the judge listens, hears cases, and decides and has to interpret and understand and apply the law. Mm-hmm. But... So just to be clear, the jury is the one that actually, like, says it, innocent or guilty, right? You have a right to a trial by jury, but you can also waive your right to trial by jury and hear a trial by judge. Ah. Not that common, huh? Because with the judge, it's just one person. But trial by jury, you get 12 people to decide your case. And you just sometimes might need just a few of them to get off. And so that, the numbers are in your favor with the jury. And if you have a good lawyer, they'll pick a good jury to help you. Because you want the justice to be on your side. Mm -hmm. We hear about laws and judges and all that stuff. And we hear about even laws in the Bible. And we're going to hear about laws today. Because there are books of the Bible. They're about laws. Like judges. Yeah. And Basically. judges. And literally the book of Deuteronomy means second law. Wow. Deuteronomy means second law. So because they retell the Ten Commandments. So we're going to hear about law codes. And who's the greatest judge of all? The ultimate judge. God. Yeah. And you pray for mercy from the ultimate judge, right? Mm hmm Because of God's grace. We live in God's grace. Order. Order. We want mercy. And so let's pray. Order. Order. I sentence this children's sermon to, pray. to prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Dear God, you are wonderful. Dear God, you are wonderful. You are a true judge. You are a true judge. With true wisdom. With true wisdom. Help us to see. Help us to see. And act. And act. As you want us to. As you want us to. Help us, God. Help us, God. In following your loss. In following your loss. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Bye. Bye. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water 
under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of Leviticus, chapter 4. If any one of the ordinary people among you sins unintentionally in doing any one of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and incurs guilt, when the sin that you have committed is made known to you, you shall bring a female goat without blemish as your offering for the sin that you have committed. You shall lay your hand on the head of the purification offering. The purification offering shall be slaughtered at the place of the burnt offering. The priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and he shall pour out the rest of its blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all its fat, as the fat is removed from the sacrifice of well-being, and the priest shall turn it into smoke on the altar for a pleasing odor to the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement on your behalf, and you shall be forgiven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark, the second chapter. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads off grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? and in need of food, how he entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. 
Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We are going by the book. During the fall, we have a sermon series here about the different books of the Bible, the different genres or types of books we have in the Bible. And by taking a big look at this, looking at the big categories, it can help us understand books that we probably wouldn't read or sections of books we may glance over and not think twice about. Hopefully, if we understand the genre, if we understand the type of writing these books are, it may help us understand our faith better and definitely help us understand the Bible a whole lot better. And that's a good thing to do. With this series, last week we had the first one, and it was on the stories, the narratives. And there's a lot of stories throughout the Bible, and there are specific kinds. There's call stories, there's birth stories, there's genealogies, there's all kinds of great stories. But today we're going to get to a different kind. When you're reading through the Bible and you start with Genesis, it's going pretty good. Genesis 1, creation, we got this Adam and Eve, Abraham, and then, you know, the fall, the kids, and then we get to Noah, the Babylon, the Tower of Babel. We continue on to Abraham and his kids, and then we get into Egypt with Joseph, and then we get to the book of Exodus and the story of Moses. My kid loves the story of Moses. He loves the book of Exodus, one of his favorite books in the entire Bible. And I can't fault him. It's a good book. It's a really good book. I like it too. And so in Exodus is where I think most people really start to get tough. It starts to slow down. It bogs us down. We're not reading as fast, or maybe we're just not as interested in it. And part of it is because we go from the stories halfway through, then we get to the laws. This is the second major category we have, law codes. Now, most of us probably are not getting excited for laws. We think about laws, we think about handcuffs and courts and prison and all these things or big, thick books of legal code. And the Bible feels that way. The first five books of the Bible are called the Torah, which is the Hebrew word for law. And so they are the law, not many laws, even though we tradition says there's 613 laws, but especially in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, in those books of the Torah, we get a lot of the law codes. Again, we may resist this. We may think, oh, this again. We read through the books. Now, granted, through even Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, there's stories sprinkled throughout. Leviticus might be the most densely collected law codes of any book, but there are stories still throughout to help us get through it. I said, because I think this is probably where most people get stuck. This is where we really have a problem. We are not thrilled by law codes. This is why legislation and governance and even courts are not usually exciting places because it's a very routine thing and it's a regulated thing and it might not be exciting for many of us. But these laws are significant. They're really important. These aren't just any laws. In the Torah, they are the law of Moses or the laws given by God to Moses for the Hebrew people. In the Exodus story, God brings the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt and going toward the promised land. And it would be a short trip, but they don't follow the laws. They're very quick to disobey and turn away from God. And in so doing, they make a long trek out of what should be a short distance. These law codes that happen in Exodus are very particular. They're interesting. They're insightful. But if we don't know how to read law codes, we might miss that out. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of details. Part of this is the incredible detail of the law codes, especially in Exodus. In this book, we hear great details of how you build the ark, the curtain, the tabernacle, the tables, everything by the cubit. And cubit is measurement from the elbow to the finger of a grown man. And so it basically was 18 inches, roughly thereabout. But by the cubit, we knew how big this building was, the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant, the poles, everything incredibly detailed. But that was on purpose because God wanted the people to hear exactly what God wanted them to know and to do. So we can understand these law codes in a couple of broad categories. The first one is the priestly code. These are the law codes I was just talking about, the how do you build the temple? How do you build the tabernacle? These are things that regular people probably didn't need to know. 
But within the priestly code we had in our first reading today, this reading from Leviticus chapter 4, which is about sacrifice. What sins do you sacrifice an animal for? And what animals go with which sin or which sacrifice? And also, how do you do the sacrifice? One of the most famous is the scapegoat, the goat who was released on the Day of Atonement. And that's still coming up here soon in September. That's the high holy days of the Jewish festival. And so these priestly law codes were impactful for the people. The people did have to know some of them about, especially after you have a kid, you have to make a sacrifice. Every year you have to make a sacrifice for your sins and you should do regular sacrifices for the sins of your family. And you should have sins atoned for that you may not have known you did. So there's sacrifices for sins you are not even aware of just to cover all your bases. And they're very specific. They talk about how you hold the animal, how you kill the animal, what you do with the blood, what you do with the entrails. We heard that in the reading. And that's kind of stuff we skim over, right? We Okay, sacrifices, okay, ooh, do that the organs, okay, burn the fat, okay, yada, yada, and you kind of want to skip on, go on faster. But there's stuff in here that's important to know, especially for the Jewish people that had to know about these things. So that's the priestly code. Another code we have is called the Deuteronomic Code from Deuteronomy. And the word Deuteronomy literally means second law because they retell many of the same laws again uh, it's been hypothesized that the Deuteronomy was actually compiled in the time of King Josiah when they found the laws and they redid them, rewrote them down and copied them and made them into Deuteronomy and added the stories of the end of the Exodus story. The story of Exodus really ends with Deuteronomy and then we get to Joshua and the conquest. And so the Deuteronomy laws are very specific, but a lot of them are rehashing similar things as before. A third category of law codes we have in the Old Testament are the holiness codes. These are probably the most significant. This in the fourth category are the most significant for the people of Israel. These were what you did, the regular laws that you had to follow. How do you work on a Sabbath? How do you plow your field? If your house has some mold growing on it, what do you do? If your kid has a skin disease on their arm, what do you do? These holiness codes were for everything, bodily fluids, field, working, everything you can imagine, a lot with slavery. And, and the slavery was not like our slavery. So the law code of slavery, the holiness codes were more about how can you fairly treat people? It's been noted by scholars that what's one thing that is very different with the Hebrew law codes and other ancient law codes is there's no caste system. All the people are treated the same and slaves were usually Hebrew fellow Hebrews. And that's what they talk about. They say, be fair to your brother or sister who is in slavery. Be fair to the slave because you were once a slave yourself. But what's amazing is the other law codes in the ancient world would have a caste system. The king, the nobles, the priestly class, these other people, the rich people, the artisans, and then the peasants. And we even here still have issues of caste system in India still today. But what's amazing is the Hebrew law code has none of that. The same law for everyone. The Babylonian, the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Greek, every ancient world we know about, every ancient culture had special laws for different groups. But the Hebrews, they didn't. Because according to God's eyes, we all should be under the same law. So that is the holiness codes. They allow the daily life stuff. And then the fourth category, which is also important for the people, are the covenant codes. And some of these are also significant for the people. But the covenant codes were, were what we hear about in the Ten Commandments. They are the start of the covenant codes. And several times throughout the Torah, we hear about these covenant codes. And Deuteronomy recaps the Ten Commandments. He basically spin them back out again. He retells them again because Deuteronomy is what they do. And so these covenant codes are, you belong to God. You are God's people. So therefore, this is what you must do. And like I said, biggest one that we probably know about are the Ten Commandments. This is the first of the laws we come across in Exodus. This was our reading today. I've had a whole sermon series on, on the Ten Commandments before, so I'm not going to go into detail about them, but I'm just going to highlight a few things. One, they're not good laws. It's kind of comical that people want to have the Ten Commandments up as a monument in courthouses and public places in America as if they were great laws. No, they're actually not great laws. They're good principles to live by, and I think maybe the lowest common denominator for society. These are good things, but they're not enforceable. They're hard. They don't have a punishment necessarily for any of them attached to them. 
that God just says, don't do these things or do these things, but not those things. And the last one is really challenging, covet. The first of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord your God. I'm the only God. Bear love and revere and respect God. And the last one is do not covet. And those two in particular are incredibly hard to enforce because it's all up here and all in here. And so the covenant with God is saying, these are what I say to be my people. The Ten Commandments are great. They're a great basis. We should know them. We teach them in confirmation, kids. But they're not great laws. They're not easy to deal with. And sometimes it might sound vague, but we have questions. And so we realize how complex the Ten Commandments get. What's it mean to not murder versus do not kill? What's it mean to not bear false witness? What does that mean for courts? What does it mean for everyday conversations? What does it mean to not take the Lord's name in vain? How do we keep the Sabbath? The Ten Commandments are incredibly complex. And so, you know, when talking about this, the, the word that is often used is Decalogue, not usually Ten Commandments. So the Decalogue, why do they say that? Because it's Greek for the Ten Words. Because they're Ten Words to live by. These Ten Phrases are great words to live and structure our society. Not easy to make into actual laws, but great as principles for how we live and should live. And that's great. And God says, you are my people. Here are these Ten Commandments. Now live by them. And this is our covenant and live up to all that I'm going to give you. I said earlier, there's 613 laws. And so the Jewish traditions, you keep all of the laws. You don't get to pick and choose which law to keep and which ones to disregard. The Jewish custom was to discuss, to debate, to memorize, to learn, to teach these laws, the Torah, in all its fullness to the kids and everyone in town. This culture of focused on the law because those who keep the law are part of the community. If you break the law, you're not part of the community. This can easily lead to legalism where people are enforcing it on each other, families who bicker about this and fight about this, and they have disagreements. So people would have to go and have to figure out so there'd be these public hearings about the law and how we follow the law. And then we have questions. Well, who's really in? Who's out? How do we follow this law? This all feeds into the legalism, where the law became an idol into itself, which is ironic. The, the thing, the very first thing God said basically is, don't make an idol. <laughs> and yet the law itself becomes an idol. Through legalism, it's a power tool. I'm right, you're wrong. I'm in and you're out. The law became a weapon with the community to enforce police and could be really brutal on each other. How do we deal with this? As Christians, how do we understand the law? Well, frankly, we don't do much with the law because Jesus challenged the law. Jesus was not the person that many Jewish people thought would be the Messiah because he questioned the law. He did not live up to how they thought the law should be. This Jewish kid from Galilee, this guy is not living the Torah like we thought. We heard this in Gospel reading today about the Sabbath. And Jesus reminds them, Sabbath was made for us. We weren't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a gift from God. The Sabbath was something that was supposed to be good for us. From the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, something good that God gave us, and we turned it into a weapon. Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. But he challenged people, and I think that was one major reason why they put Jesus to death. You don't challenge the heart of the community. You don't challenge who's in and out. You don't get to challenge Jesus. You don't get to say in who is the law. And that was a threat to them. That's a threat that Jesus posed to them. Jesus really fulfilled the law in many ways. We no longer have sacrifice. We don't have the temple. We don't have this priestly class. We don't have these saints. Why? Because Jesus was the final sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled the law. The temple was destroyed, but Jesus was the temple and raised after three days. In these great, beautiful, unexpected, challenging ways, Jesus fulfills the law. And so as Christians, we don't have our identity in the Old Testament laws. No, our identity is in Christ, the person of God, not the written law word, but the word of God incarnate, the person of God. He fulfills the law. So we are set free in Christ from the law 
but that's not easy. That's a challenge. Go, be set free, live in the gray, think, earnestly seek God in all things. I'm not going to tell you this right, that wrong, this is the law, this is not the law. That is Christians is incredibly challenging, and that's what we're called to live in. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God.
remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, creation, and the needs of our neighbors. We pray for the church, bless the missions and ministries of diverse congregations, that they uplift the good news of salvation in ways that can be understood. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for creation, send rain to lands experiencing drought, and healing to rivers clogged with pollution. Enrich the soil for trees and plants. Protect the crops needed to feed those who hunger. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for all who govern. Encourage those in positions of power to lead with empathy, practice forgiveness, and care for those who struggle. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for our neighbors who face illness of any kind, for those strained financially, for all living with chronic pain, mental illness, the disease of addiction, or otherwise afraid or in harm's way. Protect all who cry out for mercy. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for the saints who died in faith. Show us how to live faithfully, creatively, and lovingly in your church and in your world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion, made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and joy at all times and all places, to give thanks and praise to you, Almighty Father, through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by the glorious resurrection has opened the way of eternal life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join the unending hymn. Holy, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to the heal of the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, giving the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, gave disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the memory of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out upon us your spirit of love, O Lord, and unite all who share this heavenly food the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, 
spare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. God of holy rest, on the seventh day you paused, laying down the work of creation and entered into sacred stillness. Let us remember we were freed from slavery in Egypt and you called us to be people of liberation. Kindle in us the strength to say no to a world of perpetual busyness. Inspire us to set aside all of our plans and goals to receive the lavish gift of rest for ourselves. Let the Sabbath be a time of profound renewal, of intimate connection with you, and a rekindling of our holy desires to be of service. Sustain in us the desire to simply be and not succumb to the demands of productivity and an endless string of achievements. Let our lives be a loving witness to a world of restoration and refreshment, of the profound goodness of joy and delight, taking pleasure in the generous gift of pausing. Oh. 
Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in on Sunday morning or any time during the week. You can find time to connect to God on your phone, a tablet, computer, TV. I'm just glad you're here. As the people of God, we've been called to worship together together. I will let you know we have a few announcements for you. First, our ministry of the month for this month are the campus ministries of our synod. We have them at University of Kansas, Kansas State University, and in St. Louis. And we're starting new ones in Wichita and a few other locations. So if you want to make a support or a gift for the campus ministries, please make a mark on there so we can get that to them. We want to support this important ministry on the campuses. Second, this is a big one. We have our annual congregation meeting coming up next week. It's a big deal. So we'll be having it live in person here in the sanctuary and on Zoom. So if you are not in the area or if you're busy or you can't, not feeling good, we encourage you to be here on Zoom for that. We need about 65 members for our quorum. And so we can do it on Zoom and in person. So I'll be emailing out the Zoom link for that this week in the weekly wire. So that's next Sunday, 9.30 a.m. for the annual congregation meeting. We hope you could be here for that. We hope you have a great week. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for support, your prayers, your dedication. Thank you for tuning in. May this be a blessing to you for the whole week until we meet again. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.